Okay, so maybe first I should thank, in order to not forget, I repeat it also at the end of the talk, but first I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here and also to the activity, which I find this workshop extremely uh, exciting. I wanted to skip talks, but I realized I cannot skip any talks. Yeah, that's very good. And second, uh, in the name of all the participants, uh, I would like, uh, we would like to thank the Centre Emile Borel and Institute uh, Henri Poincaré and their staff for the uh, extremely nice atmosphere in which this workshop, uh, so they, they kept uh, the workshop, and uh, naturally also the organizers, but I will say that again at the end of the talk. Okay, now let me start. Uh, so this is, um, I had a hard time uh, my organizing this talk because it's also the last talk, and uh, uh, I therefore, I, it was hard for me to say, to put any technicalities in it, and uh, the talk is mainly two parts, so maybe, yes, two parts. What is new is right in the middle, and uh, it's about um, an interesting problem. Somebody asked me what is, what is that problem, namely, and uh, that is for model theory, it's no elementary equivalence, versus isomorphic problem, and um, um, there is something new going on on the problem, and that is the main part of my talk, namely it refers to, um, or stems from the possibility of defining evaluations in finitely generated fields of uh, characteristic uh, zero, and I will also then embed this problem in the bigger context in, uh, to which it uh, belongs. Okay, let's start with the beginning. So, first uh, introduction and motivation. So, sometimes now I have the feeling that I'm preaching to the choir, but I suppose that there are people here who do not know much about model theory, therefore, uh, this will make, uh, I, this is a very low level introduction to what I want to say. Namely, K and L and so on will denote fields, and K0, L0, and so on will be their prime fields. Um, respectively, K eps is the absolute part that is the inter the. So for a field, then you have K intersect this with K0 algebra, and so on, that is the absolute field. For instance, the absolute field of the complex numbers is Q bar, yeah? Q bar and so on. And uh, maybe the absolute of the reals is the real part, yes? So real numbers, real algebraic, real algebraic numbers. Okay. <coughs> Fine. And then uh, S is the set of all the sentences in the language of fields. Now I will not debate with the language of rings where you add something for the inverse for different from zero and so on, and say that is invertible. And uh, finally, the elementary theory of K is the set of all the sentences which are true in K, yes? And uh, this is a theory which uh, somehow uh, it's right at the beginning of for all model theories, namely uh, if two fields are elementary, one says that they are elementary equivalent if they have the same elementary theory, and that is true if and only if they have some ultra powers which are isomorphic. And um, I, I should not, I don't say what is the ultra power of a structure, yes? Okay. And in particular, if the two fields, if two fields have the same theory, then instantly the characteristic might be equal, the absolute parts might, must be equal, and if K is finite, K is finite if and only if L is finite, and if so, then they are uh, equal. And K is algebraically closed if and only if uh, L is algebraically closed and so on. And a naive um, classification question would be, okay, classify the fields with the same elementary theory up to isomorphism. And uh, this is maybe hard to do. I learned from uh, my advisor, Peter Roquet, that Artin, after they invented this machinery of real closed fields, tried a lot to classify the real closed fields up to isomorphism. And as we know, the problem that was not done and cannot be done maybe, yes? 
And um, okay, maybe the simplest uh, example why this is ill posed, well, when k is infinite, then the theory of k and the k star is always the same for any ultra power and they are hardly related. Well, there is a relation, but <laughs> they are far from being isomorphic, yes. And moreover, if k is real or periodically close, periodically close, algebraically close, then the theory is simply the theory of the absolute path. I would translate it for people who do periodic uh, and real and so on. That's, uh, from the algebraic point of view, you can't distinguish the Q, the algebraic part of the reals from the reals and so on and so forth, yes. Therefore, one has somehow to, how should I put it? So in every characteristic, there is only one algebraic geometry, namely that over the prime field. And for every periodic field, there is only one arithmetic geometry, namely over that over the absolute uh, of the periodic real uh, of the periodic uh, algebraic periodic numbers in that field, and so on. Okay, but uh, then this is where the problem starts. Namely, let k uh, finite degenerated be the class of all finitely generated fields. That means you take a finite uh, uh, prime field, <laughs> a joint finite domain transcendentals, take a finite extension of that. That's how they uh, occur, and then. One finally, then instantly has a more serious question. Now take two finely generated fields and suppose that they have the same theory. Does that imply that K is isomorphic to L? Now there are many ways to think about this. Imagine that you write a very complicated um, sentence over K that, and the question is that can be somehow if you redo, translate everything into algebraic geometry, Arithmetic geometry is like speaking about a very complicated constructible set. And uh, the question is, so suppose that for all constructible sets, the, 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 so a constructible set over Z has K rational points even though it has L rational points. Does that imply that K is isomorphic to L? And uh, why this is not obvious, I remember when I arrived in Heidelberg, maybe so something like maybe a few months later, Sabah gave a talk for some about something. And then at the lunch we discussed, he discussed this question. And his question was, the very concrete question he asked is, how can you distinguish between Q a join, so the function field of a curve, and Q T1, T2, where these are to trans transcendental elements. What is this about? Actually, this is more or less, this has transcendence degree one, this has transcendence degree two. Now, can you say in an elementary way, this is transcendence degree one, that one is transcendence degree two? Because this way how we teach our students, there is a T such that for all numbers, when you put T, you don't have zero, and all the other elements are algebraic over this, that's not good, yes? And because we can't answer this question, let make, let ask a more serious question, namely strong EP. Given a finitely generated field, is it true that there is a single sentence which now describes the isomorphy type of K? Yes, and here is maybe the general question, and this arose, I think, in 2007, some of the discussions of, of uh, 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 Yehud Fushovsky with uh, Zilba and so on. It was an activity at uh, Isaac Newton Institute, and Bjorn Punen was there and so on. And the question, which should be, how could one define somehow the, a reasonable class of fields such that all function fields over these, for the function of this, this question makes sense and maybe have positive answers. And note, what is actually the strong EP is simply the, is about whether the prime fields are reasonable. Yes, okay. And here are a few um, old uh, facts about this. Actually, to be honest, I did not know about this and I learned it only <laughs> later, that Rumeli proved already in 1980 that for every global field, as like there, there is a, a sentence which I will call uh, Fik Rumeli, such that for all global fields, yeah, so when you, when, when you are in the class of global fields, then one has, um, that phi k characterizes the isomorphic type of k. That means if you do arithmetic geometry only about global fields, then every global field has its own arithmetic geometry and are only, they overlap 
partially, but every global field is very, very specific in its own. Precisely like for algebraically closed fields, the algebraic closure of the prime field can see everything what we are doing in algebraic <coughs> geometry. Okay? And uh, but, uh, yes, the comment is, well, this is not precisely the strong EEP. Yes, what was the, the strong EEP? So this should hold in the class of all finitely generated fields. Now, this just says that in the class of global fields, the field is completely determined by that. And um, uh, here is um, correspondingly, so this is the uh, geometric uh, assertion, namely, if you start with an algebraically closed field and take function field of curves, then uh, the question is what does encode the theory of K? And uh, the answer is, okay, so for curves, the dysmorphic type of the function field is encoded among the function fields of other curves over C with one exception, which I think it's still open. Maybe one know that's not true. I don't know precisely. <laughs> Namely, if C is not a CM elliptic curve. And for CM elliptic curves, there is a kind of numerical invariant. I think it's called the so-and-so invariant, the automorphic invariant. And if but that invariant, you cannot compute it somehow. You cannot apply some sentence and say, okay, this is the number, the automorphic invariant. Okay. And as we see, so these results are all about dimension one. Yeah, so this is curves of dimension one, and those are curves of, now depending whom you ask, if you ask the cohomology theory, these are not dimension one, but dimension two, but if you ask the scheme theory, then these are dimension one function fields of schemes of arithmetic schemes, uh, arithmetic curves, yes. And the question is, how could one go beyond this? And in particular, what about the Sabach's question here, yeah? Yeah, what about this? And um, the answer to that is that one can use so-called uh, um, quadratic, so one can use a special class of quadratic forms which works well in characteristic not equal to two. And let me present the context. So first define the, what is the chronic dimension of a field. Namely, that is, and this works well only for finitely generated fields. So in this situation, maybe the transcendence degree of function fields over K, not only for curves, but in general for any varieties, that should be maybe the notion of dimension. Okay, but for finitely generated fields, this work, well, the, the, it makes sense for all fields, but it's very meaningful for finitely generated fields, namely the chronic dimension of K is the transcendence degree over the prime field if K is finite, that means some FP for some P, uh, or the chronic dimension of this should be transcendence degree plus one if the prime field is Q, yes. And uh, one has here, so in characteristic P, one can define P basis, namely that is a minimal system of generators of K over KP. So this is simply the image of the Frobenius in K, that means the P powers in K. And then this is a, a vector space over that and could be finitely dimensional. So if the transcendence degree of this over the prime field is one, then this is one. And if the transcendence degree is 20, but it's finitely generated, then the P basis has uh, 20 elements. Okay, and here are a few facts from uh, from cohomology uh, from of cohomology about cohomological dimension and so on and behavior of uh, chronic dimension, namely the chronic dimension is zero if and only if k is finite, clear, <laughs> and conventional dimension is one if and only if k is global, and the chronic dimension does not change al under algebraic extensions and adds one when you add one to the transcendence degree, so that is simply by the definition, yes. And now here is some serious stuff. Um, namely, this goes back to first uh, concerning P basis to Teichmüller, and then uh, the things about cohomological dimension are originally from state and so on. And there is maybe the reference to that, cohomology Galoisienne. And uh, what does this say? Let K be finitely generated and uh, denote by K tilde square root K adjoint square root of minus one. Well, that more or less says that in characteristic zero, the orderings could make problems. Therefore, you want to should work with this. And then if the characteristic uh, of K is P, then a P basis is, the P basis of K are precisely the separable transcendence basis of K over K zero. And if the characteristic is different from two, 
Then the virtual chronological dimension, which is the same as the chronological dimension of K adjoint this, that means we kill what the ordering say, is precisely the cruel dimension, chronic dimension plus one. For instance, number fields have chronic have chronological dimension two, but chronological dimension for any prime actually two. And um, global fields, function fields, function fields over of one uh, of transcend of curves over finite fields have a chronological dimension two provided, pro provided uh, the two chronological dimension is two provided the prime is different from the basis, the is is different from two. And in general, this is two. If L is different, instead of two here, you can put L. The virtual is always equal to the chronological if the characteristic is positive and so on. Okay, and the, I will, we will see in, uh, right away how, uh, what, how these things, these puzzle pieces all fit together in order to say something about our problem. The next one is to, uh, the next few things I want to say are about uh, FISTA forms. Namely, these are somehow very regulated quadratic forms. Yes? And maybe the one which is, uh, we know very well is x1 square minus a1 a2 square. And what we know very well is not this, but with minus there. And what is this? This is the norm from when you take the quadratic extension k adjoint square root a1, a1. yes? And uh, the two-fold two FISTA form is somehow, my, maybe the rule should be clear. Actually, well, this is somehow the multiplication of this form with this in the vitring, and then what comes out is this. And if you want, this is also the reduced norm of any uh, quaternion, of the quaternion algebra generated by a1, a2. Well, there is a little bit of problem here where there should be plus or minus. And I think Fister told me that in his paper, his intention was to put minus there. But they, he, they realized that actually that is so only after the paper was submitted. And in those days, young generation, you had to type everything. And if you made that mistake somewhere, you could not go back and say, change. Yeah, <laughs> no. And then he said, I leave it like that. <laughs> this is why there is this discrepancy between plus here and when you take the quality characters and so on and so forth. And um, concerning sums of square, which are very familiar, so the sum of square FISTA forms even only if the dimension is a power of two, yes. Okay, and that would be then the FISTA form, which is two to the n, that, that would be the form one and so on, one, yes. Okay, and now let's define the image of a FISTA form to be all the values the FISTA form takes except when you plug in zero, because that is clear zero. We don't want to plug in zero. And then one says that QA represents an element uh, B if B is in the image. And we say that Q is anisotropic or isotropic over K if Q does well. Anisotropic if does not represent zero. That means the FISTA form simply when you, zero is not so. The FISTA form does not have a zero, yes. And QA is universal if uh, the multiplicative group of the field is contained in there. And maybe I just an remark, side remark, actually the FISTA forms are extremely remarkable in the sense that the image it's always a closed is closed on the multiplication yeah and by the way so they are called FISTA form but it seems that so this is what FISTA form that actually that uh, Witt already had the ideas and worked with FISTA forms and proved stuff about this okay now learn a little bit about FISTA forms for instance if characteristic is different from 2 and k is this as usual then if k is finite then every FISTA, one dimension FISTA form is universal. And if K is global, then every FISTA form in two variables is universal. Yeah. So, and these follow, uh, the only way I know to prove it is using local global principles, but, okay. Next slide, and now. Now we come to our more model, well, this is saying why these are useful for what we want to do. Let N be fixed positive integer, and then the fact that these FISTA forms are anisotrope or isotrope or universal and so on over this are all formulas with the only three variables, these the, the coefficients, yes. And in particular, when you quantify over all these, or when you say there exists an anisotrope universal form and so on, these, are, these become sentences. And this is the key to 
how to go in higher dimensions to speak about transcendent degree and so on. And here is the proof. May I skip it? I think. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now we come to the hard stuff concerning crystal forms and quadratic forms. So let E be a field of characteristic different from two, and lambda equals Z mod two. And I don't know, so offer is not here, therefore nobody will say that what I'm saying is not quite formally correct. Later, yes. <laughs> so uh, lambda is Z mod two. You could think about this as being the two or roots of unity of order two in characteristic different from two. This is plus minus one. There is no Galois action of this. Now there is only a problem. What should be this in characteristic two? And therefore, I do not speak about that. But for what we want to do, Z mod 2 is okay. And we have first the vitring of anisotropic quadratic forms, equivalence classes of quadratic forms up to uh, uh, an isotropy or an anisotropy. Yes, and then E is an ideal in this, which is generated with the ideal of even dimensional quadratic forms, anisotropic quadratic forms. And then here is. Um, a theorem which I think, so Fister, it's in the big paper of Fister, but uh, I think that Witt also knew about this. Namely, if you take the n powers of this, these are precisely generated by the n-fold Fister forms. So this is why the Fister forms are so uh, remarkable. Now the next point in this development is recall the Milner K group and ring. So what is first the K ring? You take simply this, so you view this as a billion groups only and take the tensor with itself n times, take the direct sum, and then you can organize it uh, by the tensoring becomes the multiplication, and the addition is simply formal there. And uh, that is a ring, this is a graded ring, and now you take the ideal, the graded ideal generated by in, the, in, in dimension two by all tensors like this, such that the sum is one. In particular, both x and y are non-zero, yes. Okay, and that is, uh, that's another notation. This is simply the n-graded part of the, of the Milner ring. And uh, there are famous results by Tate and Milner and so on. One of these results actually was only a conjecture and then the conjecture was later proved and the people got Fields medals for that. So what proved Tate and Milner, and that is, I think, everything in this little book by, oh, it's an article by Tate and Milner. Don't remember, so I learned this in my mathematical childhood. Oh no, but I was old and I learned this. But yeah, so this is the so called Tate Tate Tame symbol. You know, there is a canonical map homomorphism from this modulo 2 in the corresponding nth cohomology group of the Galois group. And this is true, much more general. Actually, you can put here any uh, L, any M not divisible by, by the characteristic, and then you have to put here the mth power of the corresponding roots of unity, yeah? so I mean tensor power. It means you have to modify the action on this by the, by the uh, cyclotomic character, but here there is no Galois action because we are in characteristic from two, the module is E mod two plus minus one are in every base field, in every field of characteristics different from two. And then there is, I think that this was proved by Milner then, then uh, maybe, uh, that actually also there is another in, uh, map from here to there. I mean, yes, this is, remember, this was the even quality form. These are the nth power of that. And then you go to m plus one, first power. And it's clear how these work, yes. What are these? These are generated by such symbols, by n symbols. And where do you send it? Well, you send it into the cup product of a corresponding quality characters. And here, what do you do? Well, you take here the corresponding symbol, which will be A1, A2, this class of A1 up to An, and where do you send it? Well, to the corresponding Pfister form. And now here there is a little bit of a problem, because the Pfister form was defined as it was defined with a plus there, do you remember? And therefore you have to change the sign when you do this, but that means A will be sent into the character of, so square root of minus A. And now here is the, one of the very big things proven in the last decade of the 20th century, namely the Milner conjecture. You see, so I could draw here, uh, let me see the time, I don't know what I should do. So this is a very fi famous triangle, 
Yes, here you have uh, K, M, K. I don't want to change K. M, Milner of E mod 2 goes into uh, H. Lambda, lambda is E mod 2. So this is the tame symbol. And then you have here I N. And what is the Milner conjecture? One way to say that is that these both isomorphism, therefore, there is a canonical map from here to there, En, which is an isomorphism, and that is called, uh, I think that this was proof for, for n equals 3 by Arason, and, uh, but I would call it the higher cohomological invariant, Milner invariant for the quadratic forms. And then the, the, the Milner conjecture says that actually this is an isomorphism, and this is an isomorphism, and therefore this is an isomorphism. Okay. And now why is this interesting and useful for what we want to do? Ah, yes, and then that is the definition, yes. Here are the symbols, namely A1 to AN. That maps here into the corresponding quadratic, that maps into the cup product of those elements, which is then the corresponding Galois group, and then that maps here in the, quadra in the corresponding quadratic form, and then this is how it is defined. Okay. And uh, now, oh yes, and now how to use this? Well, this is the key to going in higher dimensions, and the first result in this sense, I think that the, this was proved much earlier, but finally it was published in 2002, and it says, for every d greater or equal to zero, there is an explicit sentence in the language of fields such that for all finitely generated fields, phi d holds in k if and only if the chronicle dimension of k is d. Yes? And the proof is almost trivial. A modulo the Milner conjecture. Namely, if characteristic is two, then you use the two bases and you can go ahead. And some low localizations and so on and so forth. And if characteristic is different or do the music, the Milner conjecture, you get. So what is come back? So what, what does this say? This is simply a way to say in a first order way that the cohomological class is trivial. Namely, triviality of that cohomological class is the same as saying that this is trivial, but this is simply saying that actually this represents zero. Yeah? And uh, saying that well, now on the other side, the cohomological dimension is related to the chronic dimension as we saw in the further, oh, so further, oh no as we saw here, yes? So we have the homological dimension is related to this. And that is somehow, I, I would like that the, the people interested in this have at least this take with them this, yes? So which is, and then, and then uh, Bjorn Poonen, um, seeing this, actually we had some, a lot of email exchange in those days, and then, uh, well, using other hardcore uh, arithmetic and so on, he proved that the following. So first that there is a sentence in the language of fields and a predicate such that the sentence holds in K if and the characteristic is zero. And then also the predicate defines the absolute part of this. And second, if the absolute part is, I think that the theorem is precise like this, but actually suppose now the absolute part is not characteristic zero. How do you say that? Psi zero does not hold in K. Then there is a predicate such that when you plug in, well, it's a formula in two variables, though, such that, well, become a predicate by plugging in any element which is non-constant, and then this describes then the algebraic closure, relative algebraic closure of a uh, prime field of t, a joint t in, in t in k. That means describes simply there is a first order, so another way to put it, the global sub, the global function fields which are embeddable in K are definable, okay? So, and as I said, this is quite, uh, so uses naturally this in order to do stuff, but there's also other, 
other um, very fine arithmetic. Okay? And then using this, you also can define finally that a system of elements in K is, um, uh, is relatively uh, algebraically independent over the, over the absolute field, yes? Uh, namely, you go, so it's here, everything. And I think this is not quite correct, but it's for, it would be much longer than, namely, you first take A only among the constants. Um, if all those are isotropic, then you, there must exist such an A and so on, but it's almost correct, yeah? Okay, and the conclusion is that there exists a formula in the language of fields which defines algebraic independence of finitely generated fields and so on. Okay, and now what can you do with this? Well, first of all, Rumelis now can be really transformed into really the strong Using this, now you can uh, prove Rumeli's, uh, uh, so you can turn Rumeli's sentence into something which is now really characterized as a Morphy type of global field. Why? Because we know how to say that something has Kronecker dimension one. And then you simply take the conjunction of Kronecker dimension one and Rumeli, and then you get this. And uh, so, uh, other results which follow from this is that if two fields, uh, two anti-generities have uh, the same uh, elementary theory, then they are isogenous. That means you can embed one in the other and the other one in the other one. And this is reminiscent of what happens when you want to characterize the function field of elliptic curves. What you instantly can do is you can show that the curves must be isogenous. But the high elliptic curves which are isogenous without being isomorphic. And then there is the problem, yes. Okay? And uh, building on this, then Clark, I think, uh, so yes, he is, uh, I think, at uh, the Georgia Tech now, professor. So he showed that actually, well, pushed these methods further, yes, and uh, tried to solve the, solve the EEIP, so the weak form over for other function fields. Okay. Now, what can we say about uh, so the strong EP, and as, as you say here, these are partial results, recent results, and future results. Yes, so first me, let me recall what is a prime divisor of a field, find the generated field, so it's every k evaluation satisfies the cruel dimension, uh, chronic dimension of the residue field is chronic dimension minus one. And uh, in characteristic um, uh, P, so the prime divisors come simply from all the prime divisors of all possible normal models of the, of the function field. In characteristic zero, there are also prime divisors which maybe extend to k periodic valuations of QP, or of Q. So, and those are somehow, um, those are of another nature, those are arithmetic prime divisors. And there was uh, work by, by uh, Tom Scanlon, so, also started maybe in the 90s, yes? But, yeah. And then that reduces the strong EP for every finite degenerated to the problem of first order defining the prime divisors. And I think that uh, Tom's assertion is much more precise, namely, the, if you do that uniformly, then this, I mean, the, the finite degenerated fields are uniformly first, uh, um, what is it, be interpretable in the Pressburg arithmetic, yes. Okay, and then the question is now how to define prime divisors. Well, actually, no. Before I move on, the question is, is maybe the only way to do solve these problems by simply discover the prime divisors? I do not know. And that's, for me, a serious philosophical question. Can one solve this, attack these kind of problems without using valuations? Anyway, what one can do is the following. So um, here is, first is our namely, Prime divisors of fields of chronic dimension, well, two, because the global fields we know how to handle already by Rumeli, are uniformly definable. Indeed, in particular, the strong EP holds for this and even more so. Uh, yeah, the, these are interpretable in the Pressburg arithmetic, yes. And uh, this has uh, some story because I don't know. I think I even spoke about this result and I realized that, oh, there is a gap in the proof and so on. But now finally it's published and I think that there is no gap in the proof. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and now this is maybe what I should have spoke, the, this was the main content of my talk, namely, 
Actually, the same can be done for all finitely generated fields of characteristic zero. Yeah, so here there is no restriction on the characteristic. And if you want, so actually on my web page, there is a paper like this, I call this called the EEEP2, where the only restriction on the characteristic, so instead of two is three, but the restriction one has on the characteristic is that the characteristic cannot be two. And uh, I will say a little bit more about that. And then, uh, so the, the strongest that I, so far I can prove and we know is that actually the strong EP holds in characteristic zero. And now how to handle this? So uh, first, let us recall the Rumelis method. So for global field, denote by PK the field of the space of all the places, and lambda is as before. And now here, I cheat a little bit because I do not say anything about characteristic two. But if you want to say, to speak about characteristic two, then change this two to three and Z mod two to mu three. And then everything works, yeah? So, and uh, uh, what does Rumeli use? So he uses a local global principle for norms in cyclic extension of global fields. And this, I think, this is what I understood. So please advise me or teach me what there is wrong. So I think that this was an idea already used by Julia Robinson who identified the ring of integers inside number fields and so on, and in particular in the ring of integers Z if um, you allow all the theory and so on. And from that it follows that if you have a quadratic form in two variables, that is isotropic or universal and so on, if and only if that is so over all local fields. And now this is somehow a machine which brings you in the world of evaluation. So every time when you can say something first order and invoke, involve valuations, then you finally will be able to speak about defined evaluation rings, okay? And uh, what is the lower idea of this? Well, is to use high Hasse local global principles. And this was initiated by this guy, by Kato, Kazuya Kato, and uh, he, I didn't want now to peel this like uh, onion, show you line by line. So, uh, so the point is take any finitely generated field and then look at proper regular models of the what are those. So those are proper, if you want, projective, projective regular uh, schemes over Z or varieties over Z if you want with function field K. Now you will say, do we know that those exist? And the answer is no. But, okay, if you have such a proper regular model, then uh, for that you can consider, sorry, you can consider Cato complex for any model. But uh, if you have such, you consider this complex, uh, uh, so this, uh, so Cato complex, called Cato complex, which is, you take, so imagine that D, I maybe this is not so. Maybe I should remind you what is the hasse brauer nutter local in this respect. So that is zero goes into H2 of GK lambda, and then this goes into direct sum over all V in the places of K, and that is H1, the residue field of KV lambda, and that is the complex. And now those who <laughs> are familiar with this, this is ejective, but it is not subjective, yes? And what do you have to add here? In order to make it subjective, you have to put lambda goes to zero. What are this? This is a direct sum on the invariance. So these are more or less for global fields. This is simply the space of non-trivial, non-trivial non um, um, quaternion algebras. This is Normally you go to the localizations, but for those, now you look at the structure of the Brouwer group and they take the so-called tame simple and so on. Uh, and that is, finally it turns out that every such is defined by a character, that means by a cyclic extension of the residue field, and the residue field is a finite field. And what do you do uh, in order to make it exact? Well, these are simply collection, a finite collection of elements of sigma, and you take here the sum. And then it becomes exact. Now, Cato had the idea to do the same for all higher dimensional. For instance, for dimension 
for dimension 1, for d equals uh, 2, what was in here, yes, in this, chronic dimension 2, then d is 2, that means you start at 3, you go in h uh, 2, which are now Brouwer groups, and you go in h1, which are such characters, and then what happens? Now he put there 0, but that means this is not usually not exact. Yes, it has homology. And normally, uh, yes, and now maybe I should say here, Cato's local global principle is that if you put here lambda, like in the hasse brauer then this is exact, provided k has no other rings, yes. And now why is it interesting? What do we want to do? We want to check whether this is trivial. Well, but that is the same as checking that this quadratic form is universal and uh, is trivial or not. And this is how the Milner conjectures come in. And uh, the idea would be the following. Now you look, take in K a function field which has chronic accrual dimension one less, then make the base change. This is cheating a little bit here, but anyway, so make base change from this and then you get a curve over K and then this large K becomes a function field of this curve over K. And the idea would be if F is not a constant function of that curve, the question is how could you say that the divisor of F with respect to this curve is not divisible by two? More or less this is the key to everything. And if you, the point is, the idea is you can say that by looking how do behave these quadratic, these Fista quadratic forms when A1, A2 are general, yes? And everything is first order form, uh, form, can be formulated in the first order because of this translation into the, into the um, Fista forms, yes? And uh, finally, if you can, if you have such a recipe, now you apply the recipe for what? You apply the recipe for quadratic extensions of k. And you allow which quadratic extensions where there were your symbols, these kind of symbols do not, serve, uh, do not die. What does that mean? In those quadratic extensions, f, the divisor of f, is further on not divisible by 2. What does that mean? You are allowed to take only square roots, quadratic extensions, of units at, all, at some prime in the divisor of f. Well, what does that lead? Finally, that leads to, this, to defining this. That means the parameter you use is f, f is a fixed parameter. After that, there is a recipe to plug in a1, a2, and um, in, in, well, so, sorry, in general, is, that is the hope that you can plug, you have test, you will say for all A1 to AD satisfying some first order properties, the corresponding Fister forms are not uh, anisotrop uh, anisotropic over the quadratic extension, which everything can be expressed first order, and in that way you can define this, and after that is a kind of just, uh, Oh, somehow say it, turn the crank problems to uh, deduce what are the valuation rings. Okay, now that is the hope, and that is what one hopes one can do. And what is the strategy? Well, the strategy would be to make induction on the chronic dimension, and we know already that this worked when, when this here, when this, when chronic dimension is two, then this is chronic dimension one, that means little k is a global field, and that was solved in the problem before. But unfortunately, it does not work as you think. Why? Because this Cato complex is known only in that case, that is the Cato theorem. And else, it's only, only weaker assertions are known. That means, you, if you would have the Cato complex, I even said, I think, somewhere in the introduction in my paper to chronic dimension two, that if a Cato comp the Cato local goal principle holds in the same form in higher dimension, then this proof could be, well, with some technicalities, translated in higher dimensions. Unfortunately, and I think my discussion with Janssen even say that actually he does not believe that the Cato complex is, is known, I mean, is the same in higher dimensions, yes. Okay, and now the fine print of the proof. I will go very quickly through this. Namely, we are in characteristic zero, and then the prime field is Q, and let V0 denote the uh, finite places of Q. And then there is a theorem of Janssen which says, so what was this? This was at the beginning of the Cato complex. 
uh, says that actually when you go by to what kind of localization? You simply take the compositum of K with Q completed at V. Yeah, so this is not at all has somehow not, mm, is not really what Cato intended to put in his complex. But anyways, one knows that this is injective, yes? But you do, you'd have no idea what the image is. How big is the image in this? And then uh, this was, actually this has a very long story. I think that the first result by Janssen was in 1992. And then he worked on this, was unhappy with the results. And then he went high dimensions. Meanwhile, the theory of alterations was invented. It was still not okay and so on. And finally, it appeared in the annals in 2016. And there is a previous result by Saito which quote that, yes, the, the, as reference, is Janssen in their paper, which appeared earlier, which proved the following. So, as I said before, you do not know that there are regular models. But suppose that you take a model such that when you localize at some V0, some P, then it becomes a proper regular model. For that, then they prove that the Cato complex is exact, exact as it was here, yeah, sorry. Yes, this comp, what? This complex is exact. So once again, for global fields, for finely generated, this is not exact. You have to put there a lambda in order to make it exact. That is the homology of the complex. Okay, and now I say that using these facts and some tricky induction and so on, and now this is the point where you have to, uh, where you have to yield and say, I'm sorry, I can't do things in characteristic P is namely you have to do some induction on uh, the construction you do and so on, and that does not work in characteristic, positive characteristic. Okay, why? The point is that how the induction works, and maybe this is only because my method is silly, um, you have to have that regular is the same as smooth. And I had a long discussion with Michael Temkin about this. I said, well, can you not alter it in this? And he said, yes, yes, one can. And then after two weeks, now, Florian, actually, I have a counter. Though you cannot alter it in that way, <laughs> and so on. And maybe if I have a minute at the end, or if somebody asks me what precisely is needed, I can say it at the end. What is the problem? Why this does not? So my method does not work in in um, in higher dimensions in a positive characteristic. Okay, and then knowing these valuation rings for all f and so on and so forth, then you can describe now what? You can describe all the valuations of k which are trivial on k. And now when you quantify over all possible k, which is possible by the previous results of uh, Bjorn Punen and myself, and quantify over all the f's, you at every stage you either just get garbage or valuation ring, which is a prime divisor, and that is the result. And I had two further slides, but uh, namely, I will fly through them, yes. So what is the general question? And now this is something which I understand less, but if you want to ask more, maybe you should ask Hudi because he knows. <laughs> yeah, at least. So what should be, what are the potentially reasonable base fields? First, if K is algebraically closed and you take any functional field of this, then the following holds it's an old result by, by Johann Königsmann, again, I don't know when the year was published, maybe it was published in 98 or 2000 something, but the result is older. Then there is an explicit formula which, uh, which uh, a formula, there is an, a, um, a predicate which defines the constants, yes. And uh, in the same paper of mine, I also proved that for every D there is an explicit sentence which tells you what is the transcendence degree. Now, remember that actually the previous results were only about curves because we were not able to say that this is the function field of a surface. So you can say that is a surface and then you can prove this, that if we have two function fields of the same field, then having the same elementary theory, then they are, oh, so sorry, that should be a K there because this is obvious, yeah. So they are is, uh, isogenous, that because you can embed one in the other. And uh, in particular, if this is of general type, that means if it is the function field of a variety of general type, then uh, then they must be isomorphic as, uh, as function fields because of, the, of properties. But general type is the same as curves of genus at least two, yes. And uh, there were some partial results in this direction also which students work in the working groups at Arizona School in 2003, okay. And then 
what might be the class of reasonable fields? So here is, recall what is a large field. It's a, curve, it's a field with a property that if it has a smooth point, it has infinity many smooth points. The algebraically closed are large, the real closed fields, the periodically closed fields, quotient of Zillian fields, complete domains, and so on. So um, the class is very huge. And for this field, uh, 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 with Poonen, we prove that actually what you can do, so there is first a predicate which defines always the constants, and there is a predicate as before which defines algebraic independence. But this is where we have to stop. And uh, maybe it's the suggestion that absolute feature analysis are reasonable. And thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Before I forget, and and uh, speaking in the name of all of us, please. So this should be recorded. You are very grateful to the staff and the organizers of uh, the, the the conference. I mean the mechanics of the organizing. Uh, so personnel from the, of the center, Emil Borel, and Institute Henri Poincaré. So thank you for...